Linda Brad is currently uh, one of the big guys at uh, Jazz FM 91. And he is the person to whom I always send music. Well, actually not to diminish what we do, but we send to almost everybody. But Brad is the one and Danny who are, who are the two people who will decide if we're going to get play. And I've been a publicist for an awfully long time and uh, that role kind of morphed into other things, which is um, artist direction, if you like. And, um, and I know all these people so I can go to them and beg for their assistance or their support or their honest opinion. So basically what we want to do today is to have everybody talk a little bit about um, how they got into this, what they want. We want, want to keep this to the time, so maybe five minutes per would be great, and then maybe we'll have a bit of time to uh, answer questions as we go. Marilyn, do you want to start the conversation? Hi. Um, I started uh, in this business because I was a musician, and uh, I was working for an artist. I was studying with an artist, and I realized that in order for her to do her work as a musician, she needed all her time. So I just, just started helping her by making phone calls and writing letters and, and doing all of that. And then I, I really fell in love with the business and with the uh, excitement of getting concerts for people, which I still feel after 37 years, uh, every time I send out an email, I'm, st I'm still excited uh, at, at, the, at the fact that maybe somebody will actually be interested in what I'm, I have to talk about. And I love working with artists and teaching them about the uh, music business as it is today and how it has morphed and ha giving them the tools or help give, the, give, it, give them the tools to uh, deal with what we're all faced with, uh, which is much more difficult than it was 25 years ago or 10 years ago. So that's about what I have to say. Um, do you have the, oops, sorry. Do you have um, uh, any practical advice, a couple of points that you would suggest to anybody when they're coming to or trying to get an agent slash manager? Yeah, I, I think that, uh, that you should really be individual mm -hmm. and not, uh, and, and be who you are and, and sell what you have as, as a person and your story, uh, because that is what people in the, in, uh, the audience, fans, and uh, presenters, and therefore managers are looking for. Somebody that's individual, somebody who has something to say, and, uh, and somebody who has the ability to reach people in the audience uh, that there's nothing more important. I mean, we can all learn to move our fingers. I was a violinist. We can all learn to move our fingers, but we have to learn how to make that count and how to make that mean something. So I, I try to talk a lot to my artists about that, and I decide which artists to take uh, by my sense of their ability to com communicate. Great. Richard, do you want to talk about what it's like being an artist in this world and trying to do it all? Yes. I remember doing a seminar many years ago where I had a bunch of different hats that I would put on. <laughs> okay, now I'm the artist, now I'm the, you know, I'm trying to get gigs, now I'm the publicist, because that's what I did certainly in, in the early days of the Shuffle Demons. The Shuffle Demons started as a street band, and uh, you know, the lesson from that, I think, is, is if, if you go out there and do something, as you were saying, that's, that's unique and interesting, then, then you can gain a following and people get, get excited by it. So that's what we were about. And we started getting gigs and clubs. And so I just really wanted to jump on onto it. In fact, I, I didn't go back for my, my next year of university because I was really just wanted to work on the band. 
So what I did in the old days, I would put sign-up sheets on the, on the tables and get names for a mailing list. We started our own fan club, which was, we'd send, we'd actually mail out a newsletter in, you know, old school and, and, and spend money on stamps. And it really started to, to, to happen. And one of the other things that we did in that newsletter, we were talking about the Shuffle Demons, but we were also, I would, maybe someone would give me $50 and I'd mention their gig as part of it. So it became something just a little bit more than just us talking about ourselves. We were also including some interesting things from other people who were on the music scene. So that, that really sort of helped to build this following that we had. Um, so we did some other unique things to try and attract attention. Uh, we toured the streets of Europe playing as a street band and I found addresses for the Globe and Mail and, and, the, and the Star and things and so I typed a press release with silly things like tried to play the streets of Venice with you know little success <laughs> because there were canals, <laughs> that sort of thing, and they printed it. So you know, it, if, you, if you're audacious and, 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 and engage, you can actually, uh, you can make a way forward. And it, I think it was a little easier back then because no one was doing that. And we were really one of the first sort of indie bands. So it was, it, it was, it was kind of, we were in that first wave. So people weren't expecting it and it was a little different and it was easy, but you know, we spent a lot of time trying to make it happen, and it, and it really paid off in the end. And of course, that's morphed into now uh, tweeting and um, Instagramming and all of that. So these were really forerunners of, of all of that. Um, Brad, do you want to talk a little bit about um, what, it, what it takes to get attention and play on Jazz FM? Uh, I, I think the first piece of advice I would give is make a great record, you know, and, and that is the... The, the the beauty of our radio station and also as part of the curse is that we don't have the same filters when it comes to people sending us our music. At, at a commercial radio station, it's usually coming from a vetted person first, a manager or a label. But I'm getting Richard's new CD and I'm also getting a guy who plays saxophone in Vermont's CD because he's gone through a list and they're all coming to us at, at, without a lot of gatekeepers outside of that, which is great because that means we get a lot of music and we get to experience really what's happening, but it also can be overwhelming at, at, at the same time. So the, so I, I think especially when it comes to jazz music, I think no one is doing themselves a favor uh, by, by doing a, a standard catalog in a standard way on an album, um, that, that you have to do something now um, that is unique, and, and to Marilyn's point and Richard's point, that connects with people I I in a way that, that you have to believe in and that you have to follow uh, uh, y your, vo your inner voice in a way. So do something great, do something unique, and then find a way to communicate with any of us at the radio station or myself uh, in a way that puts you in our face but also doesn't... Uh, doesn't there's, there's a real fine line between being aggressively support, uh, promoting your CD and also having the tipping point go to where it's, it's actually working against you a little bit. I, I like Richard's when he, he mentions do things creatively and with humor, and, and that, those things jump out a lot more than any type of press release or email that comes that laundry lists maybe you know, where you went to school and, and, and some of those, those kind of more broad accomplishments, uh, winning an award or those things. Th th those things are less engaging at this point than, than really telling me something about yourself and the music that we're going to experience. And really, as quickly as you can get to the music that you have sent to the radio station and why it should be listened to, I think is, uh, is the, the best way to create a short. Everything needs to be so you know, quick and, and the communication needs to be concise and engaging and all those things work to your advantage when you send something along. But at the end of it, it's got to be that, that really great piece of music that, that comes our way. Oops. I can't see. Um, <laughs> sorry. So, okay, so what you've got here is three different perspectives. From my perspective, um, my company, Jane Harbour Publicity Inc., if I could do it over again, I'd, say, I'd call it Encore Productions or whatever, but certainly not my name because that's a bit of a liability sometimes. What I would say to any artist, if they're, coming, they're wanting a publicist, is that um, they understand that there's an awful lot of people looking for a publicist. Publicists have to understand that there's a very, very limited amount of money available for them. Uh, so we have to believe in the artist. That's foremost number one. I, I get a lot of calls, and even if I know the artist, and I know a lot of people in this city, in this country, 
I'm, I'm not interested in taking them just because, because that's not doing them justice. So I want to listen to each piece of music as it comes, and that's how I make a decision whether or not we move forward and sit down and talk. Um, the music is everything. The music has to be everything. Uh, there's no point doing it if, if it's mediocre, in my opinion, which doesn't mean that other people would find it so, but if I can't get behind it, you would not be doing a service to yourselves and I would not be doing a service to you. And I have to have a credibility factor too when I come to Brad or to whomever else when I send the music that they know that it may not be for them, but what I'm pretty sure of is that they're not going to be able to say that it's not good. Um, so we all have to work together. This is about a conglomerate. This is about a community. Um, and I'm always excited when I get somebody, uh, well, Rich and I have done a couple of things together, and I'm always excited when that comes up because he's nothing if, um, if not amazing. Um, and, uh, and, and I would always try and help him. Uh, and I feel that it's a credibility factor. If I don't believe, I shouldn't take you on. Has nothing to do with the, the quality of your music. Understand that. So we work together. We all work together. I have to know who to send the music to. I have to know what the package should contain. And I have to know how to approach the media. And if the artist isn't ready, I will tell them that the, we're not, we're not really, you're not ready for us and we wouldn't want to take your money. So. This is all about a community, and we have to understand that because there's limited finite financial arrangements, there's limited play, there's very limited media press-wise these days, like print-wise, um, but there's a lot of people doing blogs who were employed by major print outlets, and they can be invaluable to you. Um, but there's a lot of work involved. Outside of CBC and Jazz FM, in terms of jazz music, there's one really good station in Winnipeg, and there's Campus Radio. And those are probably the most key um, places we can go to with good results, or with results. It may not be, again, to their liking, but at least we know we can get it to them. Um, here's, here's an interesting little factor. We send out about 160 albums to, uh, for each campaign, more if there's a national tour. Um, but so far, six media people, and, and this is an actual number, six media out of that 160 or so have requested digital only. That, that's all we have had requests for. I'm not saying that they won't be received digitally. I'm saying that, that they have actually said, could you send it to me um, via Dropbox or, or whatever. Uh, there's still an awful lot of media who want to receive the package, they want to see the CD, they want to look at the art, they want to read who's on the album. And one quick uh, hint before I pass it back to somebody else. Uh, when, with, with when you're put doing your package together, do not put brown words on black cover. I, I'm just saying, okay? Uh, it's awfully hard for anybody to read anything and they tend to get irritated and pass it over because if they haven't got a talking point, they've got very little. Well, here's a new record and we're gonna play a track. We don't know what it's called, we don't know who the artist is because we can't read it. Um, so you want to make sure that it's clear that it gives the details and you want to make sure that you have a good one sheet. The one sheet is uh, simply that. It's a bit of bio. It's, when it's a singer-songwriter and it's the first time, we often ask the singer-songwriter to write a couple of lines about each song. Because then, again, there's context for media to talk about. Um, it's the uh, Maple logo. And it's, what's that thing where it says, hum, it, it, like the, the thing that says it's registered with, what is it called? You know that bar thing? <laughs> The, there's, a, there's, there's a thing where it was, it's registered um, for media to, to know um, that it's Canadian, that they get the, the details online. It goes, oh, yeah. DMDS. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so you want that, and you want a picture. Um, you don't need to have a big picture. You don't need to, by the way, have pictures printed anymore for media anyway, um, because they're going to be on your website and they're going to be good and they're going to be high res, 300 DPI or better. 
Um, so now I would like to say to Marilyn, Marilyn, do you want to tell us how, you, how your process is, other than you, you like what the artist has, that takes you to, to decide whether you would like to work with them? you want to expand on that a little? Yeah, I mean, I, I also would like to, if possible, let peop tell people some things that I've learned that are, I mean. that are really important, especially if you don't have a manager. And that is that we all, including me, uh, have to take the time to understand and know about the people we're pitching our stuff to. Uh, that it, it, it's of ultimate importance. So that if somebody comes to me as a manager and they don't really know what I do or ha uh, haven't looked at my website or you know, they come uh, with a kind of music that I've never dealt, like an opera singer calls me, <laughs> because I don't work with op opera singers. So I know immediately they haven't really looked to see what I do. And it's the same thing. If you want a radio station to play your music, you have to take the time to find out what exact kinds of music that radio station plays. And if you want uh, to, to get a concert at a festival or at a performing arts center, you have to go over a few years of their presentations mm -hmm. and see what it is that they present. And when you uh, contact the people, any of them, you have to ask them what works for them. If you start talking about yourself, it, it often turns people off. So it's very important to engage with the person uh, and find out who they are and what works for them and what they're interested in. And then you can make your pitch to a, a person, not just in the thin in thin air. So, I mean, I look for people to take whose music, A, I love. I, I, I can't sell some. Somebody once said to me, what's your marketing, t what marketing <coughs> tools do you use? And I said, I, I, mark, I sell what I love. And, and, the, and I don't need a tool other than my own love of that music and, and the opportunity to express that and communicate that. And uh, I think that, that that's the most important thing. I think very often in our world today, we, we talk about uh, ideas about music and uh, you know, uh, government ideas about how to sell, about what's happening in the business and all of that. And, and I feel like, we need to all think about the music. Mm -hmm. The music is what we're here for, the art. We're here to share art that makes the world better. And if we keep that in, in mind, uh, I think that that is what's going to make something uh, last and, and have legs and grow. One other thing is that it's absolutely important for people to realize that there's no such thing as an overnight, overnight success. Mm -hmm. And I look, for, I look for people who understand or have the openness to learn about the process of building a career, which takes, as somebody said before, <coughs> it takes 20 years to become an overnight success. <laughs> And it's very, very true. Uh, those are some of my And they're really important factors that what Marilyn is talking about. Richard, have you ever had a um, manager officially? Um, for maybe for a brief time, but it, we really have ended up being, uh, um, with the Shuffle Demons and with myself, uh, someone who, who or our, our groups that have done it ourselves. I think with the Shuffle Demons, it's, it's kind of unique. So it's really hard to find someone who, whom 
can slot it in their mind with what they're doing because we do such a broad um, range of, of, of different kinds of music. The great thing is that it's a very visual band, it's a very sellable band. So one thing I'd like to talk about is really digging in the corners. And what, what Stitch Winston does, who's, who's kind of taken over the, most of the, a lot of the booking for the band, we work as a team, he just, he works so hard. He Googles Jazz Festival and no matter where it is, he sends them something. So we've been to Havana, we've been to South Korea, we've been to Japan, we've been to Thailand. It's not just jazz festival, he'll just Google festival and, and then he'll send them something. And the good thing these days is you can send them something that doesn't really cost you anything, you can send them a link. The bad thing, of course, is that they're flooded. Everyone gets a million things. So you have to try and, and, and just be persistent and if you get, if you get that one lead, then, then follow it up. If I could go back to radio for a moment sure. and use the same line of thinking. When I released my uh, CD that in 2003, I guess, that eventually won a Juno, I would, picking up on Brad, Brad's point, it was my first sort of jazz CD after this Shuffle Demon's success, so I really wanted to make it great. So I did a first session. It was good. There were still three tunes I wasn't happy with. I went back and recorded them again. You know, that was crazy. I went over budget and everything, but I really wanted it to be great. And, uh, you know, I hired some really great people. So that really helped in, in making it just a, a CD I was really proud of. I really worked hard on it. And, you know, the order of songs, I worked hard on that. And what I would say to that point is, often people might bury their best song in the middle. Okay, we'll build up to that best song. And that may have been a great idea at some point. I don't think it's a great idea anymore. I think that CD goes on, or the music comes on, bang. First song, wow, this is great. You really have to, and I would say this also if you're applying for grants, don't make the third song the best song. The first song really has to hit people over the head in a good way and say, wow, I want to engage with this. I love it. Once you send the CD, um, I did something for Jazz FM and for actually a lot of other stations, CBC included. I made a radio edits CD. So I went in and edited my song. Some of them are eight minutes long. I edited it down to about five minutes. And I put a whole CD of all songs five minutes or less, approximately. That gave the, the programmers who, who may be playing in more commercial environments than college radio the opportunity to program any of the songs. They were like, well, let's program a different one. Hey, look, they're all under five minutes. That, that gives us a chance to fit it into our format because it's a little different when you're doing with a more commercial station than college. That's a really good tip, I think. And you, if you edit it yourself, you have control over, over what, you know, what, you, what you might um, put on there. I also, when I send out my one sheet, I would put a line about every song. You know, this um, reminds one of ECM in, in 1970. Or, you know, just a little line so that, that, once again, you're making it easier for that person who's overwhelmed by CDs. Oh, hey, well, that, that's the kind of thing I like. Let's throw that on. College radio. I would go, I think Earshot, I know they used to have a list of all the, so it's earshot.ca or .com, I can't remember. Earshot.ca. They had a, a, a list of all the college radio. I would, of course, send one to the programming director and also, you know, go to the website, make sure that the programming, the information is current. But I would go through and look at the schedule of the station and find, oh, there's a jazz DJ, oh, there's a jazz DJ, mm, there's a jazz DJ. And I would send it directly to those people. In college radio, there are often people volunteering. And, hey, someone sent me an actual CD. Okay. This is, you know, they appreciate it because they're, they're not getting anything out of it other than their love of music and their, their desire to, to, to push the music forward. So when you actually treat them really well and, and send them something personally or maybe email them personally, I think it really goes a long way. So if you're starting out or even if you're already established, and even if you have a publicist, you can add to what they're doing with this extra leg work, which is a lot of work, but can really help to build momentum and push your music forward. That's right, and that's why we do, uh, Richard doesn't need us, because that's exactly <laughs> what we do. We send to, to the music director slash uh, program director, uh, because they actually log into the library, and then we send to, to uh, a very select um, list of hosts, and the hosts are also producers at, at campus I'm talking about, and they, there is no money for these guys, and they, they get nothing out of it except a CD from us, and it's personalized, and we find, we know who we're going to, we know that they have a show that is for 
um, vocal jazz or whatever it is we send to that person. And then we go to the people who have shows that have uh, interviews. And so we'll go and we'll try and get them to do a uh, talk to the artist as well. Um, Brad, what, what I'd like to know is, and I'm sure people would, um, without giving away all the secrets, but how, do you, how, how does the process go when you receive an album? What, what do you do before you decide? I, I would first like to say the reason Richard has been as successful as he has been is because everything he just said, it, it completely is the right move as far as from where I'm sitting. And this is a guy that, w that already had a national profile. That, those are the, the care that he went into making his first record after already really having a national profile is something that any first artist should really take heed with. Um, I think the ease at which you can make a record now is it, it can sometimes be a trap because you, you, you feel like you may be ready and it's very easy to get something out there. But I would definitely wait until you feel like you've got something extra special or taking that extra time like Richard talking about going back in and re-recording. I'll tell you that you only get that one chance to make a first impression. And when a record comes on my desk that I know that there's some talent there, but I can also tell that this kind of was quickly done to sort of get out there and you've got something to give your friends now and you can sort of have this, this realization of what you're doing, but it, it really will stop amongst the cluster of your friends after that, unless it's something that has a bigger statement than that, and, and something that that has a, a, a more of a quality to it. So uh, all, all those, I will tell, tell everyone who is in the jazz world when you make a record first thing, if, if we play your record on Jazz FM 91, we are only one very small part of having a career. We, we, we're not, this isn't chum in the early 70s where if we add it, things are going to dramatically change in anyone's life. So I also like to manage the expectation of what you get from being on the radio station because that could also change how you approach the music that you make. If you're tailoring it to get onto a radio station, that make sure that that is still within the vision that you have as a, as a musician. Because if you alter it in some ways just to get on Jazz FM 91, you might feel that you, it, the payoff might be less than you had imagined. But I do think we are very much part of a 360 of doing live gigs, getting some press that's outside of our radio station, and having your, your album on, the, on our, our radio station and maybe on other outlets as well, that the collective of all those things can really have a bump, but it, 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 we're only a, a small part of that. So if you don't want to uh, edit your tunes because your vision was a 10-minute tune and that feels like the right thing to do and, and then you don't care if we play it, then I think that is also the right approach too because uh, it, it should be you should have that thing in your hand that you feel incredibly strong about because it will be yours to carry and to and to uh, and to and to and, and to promote for quite a long time so we get we, it's the wild west now as far as formats go uh, we, we get the soundcloud we get dmds we get mp3 sent to us we still get cds tent, sent to us as jane said i'm still in the in the world of liking a hard cd sent to me i don't know if it's age I don't know if it's the, the genre we're in, but I still like having that thing. And for a lot of reasons, I think more in jazz than anywhere else, I do like to know the players that are on the, on the music. If I don't know you as, the, as the, the person who's on the front of the CD, if I've seen that you've surrounded yourself with other musicians that I am familiar with and that are of quality, then that immediately puts you into a different kind of stack that is, is going to be prioritized in a different way than if I don't recognize anyone, anyone on that CD. Um, but you know what? It still can come electronically with some follow-up, and especially if you give me the same information that I will get from that CD. But I also said earlier, too, having a CD on the desk and in the office is this constant reminder of how I have undermanaged my job and not have listened to it. So having that reminder around all the time that I should listen to it is, is not a bad thing to have. And an email that was something that was sent to me or a link it gets buried pretty quickly at the bottom of that email load by the end of the day. So it, it, it has kind of a twofold effect. It's a constant reminder. That, and then those follow-up follow phone calls about, do you have my CD, is it there? Those things really can create a lot of guilt, and that means I got to get it in the player and start listening to it. So that's, and then everything after that, as Richard said, please put your best tune f first. If you want to have radio play, don't start with 36 bars of a groove, uh, you know, we, we, we have to get to it. Uh, so the, if, 
even though jazz isn't a hook music, there's got to be something in there early on. I work in radio. I don't work in the, in the live environment. That's the laboratory, I think, where you can really experiment in different ways. But I still have people who are on the 401 in traffic at 540. And I still want to deliver them a great musical experience. But it also has to be within that context is what I'm approaching my job with. Because that is the, the, the city community and listenership that we serve here in the city. Um, so make, make those good ones first. Make, make that stuff tight off the top. And if it is about edits, then and that's a great approach. Because then you can have sort of the best of both worlds. And then, uh, and then have start creating a dialogue. With Jane, you, you usually go to the front of the line because I have a relationship with Jane, but I will say 75% of the artists I deal with, it's just one-on-one -on -one with the artists. They don't have the tier of, of managers or anything else. They, they call, they send email, we dialogue, and, and that is a, as valuable a relationship. It doesn't, it doesn't qualify things any more or less if you have a publicist or a manager. Again, it comes down to, have you made something really great that I can't wait to play on the station? That's really interesting for people, I think. And, and from my perspective, it's, uh, it's about us being able to go to a Brad, uh, a, a, a Brad, Brad, and people who, who are in the position he's in, and honestly say, have you listened? Please do. We know that we've got something special. I can't lie about that. I would never do. I would never lie about that. Um, what we also do sometimes when we're doing a mail out is because we listen to the whole album for the record, for the for the history, before we decide on taking on an artist. We listen very carefully to what we're here, what we've been sent, and and if we think there's one track, for example, um, if the strings on it. Um, we will we will send with a note to the um, music director at um, Classical 96 and say, check out tracks five and nine. They, they may be pr appropriate for you. Um, with no offense to anybody, if we get an album that's got an electric bass and or um, a horn of some kind, we will consider and think about sending it to um, the wave because they love to have electric bass and um, horns. And so we'll identify that. We, we, what we do is we, we make a very concise and clear um, list of who we think will be interested and why. We don't want them going and putting the first track on. It's like Richard saying, if you don't put your best track at the front, you're, you're going to lose it. When we want people to go and listen because we think we've got something they might like, we will identify the track and suggest they listen to that. Um, do you have something to say, Marilyn? Please do. Uh, I go every year to a seminar about promoting world music oh, yeah. in New York. And one of the most valuable things I learned from a panel of people who do the hiring in very major uh, venues was that we have to really be careful, especially in this day and age, with all the uh, ways that people learn about you. For example, people especially who make choices and curate concerts, et cetera, et cetera, they use YouTube a lot. Don't put crap. <laughs> on YouTube. Uh, it doesn't help at all. Don't think, oh, well, this is free, so I can just, you know, make a, do a, uh, record a song in my living room and put it on, because that's going to affect your career. And it's really important in, to keep everything of a certain level. If you want it to be on the radio, if you want live concerts, you must uh, not just use uh, social media as uh, an inexpensive way to uh, get your music out there unless it's the top quality. Also, in terms of the way you use Facebook and the way you use Twitter, again, be aware of people and what you're offering them, not just what you want them to do for you. It's the same thing as going, think of it as going to uh, a cocktail party. If you go to a cocktail party and you meet somebody 
and you say, hello, my name's Marilyn Gilbert. I did this, I won this award, I did this, I did that. They're not gonna wanna talk to you. <laughs> so, so, you know, ask them about them, ask the people, or uh, engage the people that you're uh, posting to about them. And uh, become, and show them that you're a communicator rather than just talking about yourself. Okay, you have more time. I just wanted to t touch on what Marilyn had said. One time it was, uh, there was a festival director in Mexico uh, looking at my, uh, you know, someone who recommended me. And uh, they were searching YouTube. And it was a kind of a classical music festival which had a jazz component. So, you know, they're pretty straight ahead, but great, great people. And the first thing that came up for me was, this thing I did in Kensington Market called Drop Your Pants for Peace. <laughs> and so I was playing with Michael Johnson, who's a trumpet player who's in the Lemon Bucket Orchestra, great, great guy. He was in, pardon me? Oh, yeah, there, you, there you go. And he had like a, a sort of a skull costume on, and I was sitting there in a robe with my pants dropped for peace playing. And so that's the first thing that came up, which is pretty funny. But they hired me anyway. They went, okay, well, you know, and it was also a free jazz thing we were doing. But, one thing I sort of learned out of that is, you know, make sure you have something great out there that comes up first. And the other thing is, also on Facebook, you know, people will tag you, right? They'll see you performing and they'll tag you. And, you know, you might be like playing in a strange way or <laughs> leaning back and with your eyes closed and, and, and or your stomach is sticking way out. So sometimes, I, I actually on the Facebook, I have this thing where I, have, I get to, to um, approve that it goes on my wall at least so that, that these kind of funny pictures don't show up sometimes. You know, I mostly I prove everything, but sometimes, you know, and you also have people with, with uh, strange links or, or sales links or whatever, so if you can manage that a little bit, that also helps with the profile. Thank you. We're going to open it up to some questionies, if anybody has anything to ask of any of us. Put your hand up or stand up or... Nobody wants to know anything? Yes, this is, oh, okay. Did you, over there. Yeah, Google Alerts are fantastic because it not only does it, it, it warn you of things that might be negative, but it also warns you, you know, tells you about the positive things. Maybe you got a review somewhere in a different place and you didn't, you know, you're not monitoring the Saskatoon uh, Times colonist or whatever, or Victoria Times colonist. So that review comes up and now you can put it on your website or you can just send out a, a note on Facebook. Hey, look what just happened. Another thing about Facebook too is that you know, don't, as Marilyn was saying, don't always be talking about yourself. It's nice to you know, often if I see someone else that's having a gig, I might promote that, or, or uh, you know, you, you, maybe you'll include links to some of the great music that you heard. It builds an, an interest in, in that you can be a person that people would go to for interesting things, and then you throw in some of your own stuff every once in a while, and it creates a more well-rounded profile that people will be more interested in engaging with than hey, I'm doing another show. And from just on that level, from my perspective, uh, social media is great, but it is just a tool. It is one of the tools that we use. Uh, we are very, very, very careful not to over, uh, except for the cats. I put a lot of cats <laughs> up on Facebook, but um, generally speaking, I only post things on Facebook or Twitter or um, whatever format we're going, uh, very, very selectively and very infrequently. Um, we still use regular email as a very, very major tool. Uh, we use media releases as a very major tool. So you've got to combine these and you've got to include, as Richard said, you have to include um, other people's um, other people's events, you have to show engagement, otherwise it's going to be all about you all the time and people are going to tune out. There's another question over here, I know. You know, there's a lot of, 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 of you know, jazz is this evolving music that can have a lot of different components to it all the time. So I, I welcome that. It doesn't have to be, you know, an Oscar Peterson trio sounding recording to, but uh, so we take everything as it comes and when you play something, this is where, you know, at the end of the day, that I have a job to make those decisions, whether they're right or wrong. I bet we could get a lot of people here that would say they're wrong, but ultimately that is the job that I have. So I listen to something, and if I feel that the jazz elements of it are enough for our listenership, then it, it does get played. Improvis improvisation really can play a role in that. Is there some type of solo section? Is there some kind of rhythmic variation? Um, is the harmony maybe a little denser than, than conventional 
harmony, all those things sort of go into something that I think can sound like jazz, even if it isn't swinging and, 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 and trading fours and all those conventional things. So everything's on the table as far as what we would think about. You're kind to say, thank you very much. I'm not sure how much I have to offer. I think uh, as a musician, so I, I went to St. of X, I got my X ring on here, I graduated uh, back in the, in the 80s, I took the jazz program there, there and have a jazz degree as a musician, never thinking that down the road it would, I would be at this jazz radio station and never really thinking I would be a jazz musician either. Um, but to me it was this great foundation just to be a musician. But I think when I moved into working at the radio station I felt that the one thing I didn't want to have to lean on a lot of the time was, hey, did you know, anyone ever hear The Pursuit of Happiness? <laughs> I used to be in that band. So for me, it was almost something that I wanted to put away as opposed to sort of front with. Um, it seemed like a new adventure and, an, and, and it also felt like it, I wanted to be there for the musicians in the community and not be the guy that was, it was a great part of my life, but I, I, it is something that, Let's just say the bass is pretty dusty and under a couch right now. Um, but, but to me, it was this freeing moment to be able to now be a bullhorn for so much of the great music and musicians that I had crossed paths with over the years and wanted that. But to answer your question, I, I haven't done any uh, teaching or, or instructing, uh, but I'm always looking for offers uh, to supplement. So thank you, though. Sorry. Uh, it, it would be lovely if that was the case, but it, uh, realistically, it never will be, I don't think. Um, and also, just on that level, uh, uh, I would say we do three follow-ups when we do an album mail-out, by the way. We, we contact our media darling people three times, at, at which point, after three times, we stop, because we have to come back to them with somebody else, and we don't want them to screen their calls and never talk to us again. Mm -hmm. So we know what, what we can expect. When we do a, a CD release for, say, 160, sometimes it's more, sometimes it's less, depending, um, we expect in the first follow-up, we expect about a 10% response. Um, that is actually better than you might think because there's no such thing as, um, as a time limit on the music we work with because we're not working singles. We're, not, we, we're in a marathon, we're not a sprint, as I tend to say. So uh, we may find out that somebody starts playing our, our artist album six months later because we know how it works. We know the, the, the number of artists they get uh, hit with every day. Um, we can only go so many times to them. We have to let it alone. But we monitor. We have Google alerts for charts and, and the artist names so we see when there's activity. And we keep, we keep responding to our artists. Um, we don't basically say, okay, three months is up, you're done, don't ever darken our doors again. Um, we keep that artist's CDs there, and if anybody requests it, we'll send it out again or send it for the first time if we miss them. And uh, we'll, we'll keep monitoring and let the artist know. We're actually working with a, an amazing young lady, Amanda Tosoff, and uh, she has a beautiful, beautiful album. It's called Words. And um, it, she put uh, music to poems, including uh, Daffodils by Wordsworth. And um, we're just now, we started with her in pff, late January, I guess. And we're just now um, starting to see more activity because we've given people space and time and they're getting to it. Um, I would give you one hint, and I'm being very kind to you when I say this hint because I, it's our bread and butter. Uh, we have found that the best time of all to release albums for the record is uh, to have it arrive on media's desks sometime between Christmas and New Year. Because what happens is they come back after the holidays, everything has been Christmas or holiday music all the time for December and, and uh, into January when the um, Ukrainian Christmas is January 6th or whatever I think. Um, and, and so we wait and then we send, we, send, uh, we send it out between Christmas and New Year. So it's on their desks when they come back after the holidays. They're looking for music because they've been playing all this holiday music for weeks and weeks and weeks. I once worked on an album called Jingle Cats and, uh, and we got a lot of mileage. But as soon as Christmas was over, they wanted nothing to do with Jingle Cats anymore. But the fact is that this is a, a time frame that we have found is tried and true. Just don't everybody do it at once or else my c cover is blown. <laughs> the story is what it is. 
Um, again, uh, that, would, that would lead me back to saying, don't invent about stuff about you in a bio. Tell it like it is. If you haven't got a lot to say, don't pad it, because your cover's going to be blown. Um, the more story you have, the better. But, but if you don't have it, then the music has to speak for itself. Um, is that, is that answer your question? I'll just say, not to influence clients, but just as far as a, a music perspective, if it's, if, if it's high concept uh, and, and there's a big backstory around the entire piece, it, that can be sometimes hard to convey in a, in a short clip before it's played on air. So if the backstory kind of over, overtakes the song, then it's hard to have that tune in, in kind of a rotation where every time you need to frame the context of what the story is. Um, so that could overwhelm the music sometimes. But so uh, I, I would say it, don't let it be too much of a lead weight around the work itself. Yeah, I agree. So the question was, um, if I was releasing an album, if we were releasing a Shuffle Demon album, what would the press release look like that we were going to be sending out? Um, so I, I, I learned from people like Jane that the typical one-sheet sort of format is, is, you know, you've got a one-sheet, you've got a picture of the album, you may have a picture, a little, a little picture included of the band. That's kind of a nice visual thing. You frame it up nicely. Um, I would talk about the exciting new release. I would talk about just a little bit about what we've been up to recently, we've toured here and there, we played these festivals, now we're back into the studio, it's our first release after X amount of time, it's exciting. Then talk a little bit about the songs, and this is where if we were a, a more of a jazz fusion uh, group that, that wasn't necessarily uh, you know, coming out with music that would be from the, from the get-go, and the first song may not actually be something that would be necessarily playable on all the shows on Jazz FM, that's when I would go, you'd have to tailor it a bit. So for some radio stations, I would just say this is a great funk rock tune, you know, to start off. But I might make a note for Jazz FM or tailor the actual press, press release for the different jazz radio stations. Here's six instrumental tunes on this album, which also has vocal tunes. Focus on these ones. So once again, it's tailoring a bit. Um, and you might actually have a different press release for a different radio station. You know, you might just have, a, okay, this is, my one, this is the one for people who are more likely to play instrumental jazz or something within a more jazz context than a funk rock or a funk rap context that the, the demons do. Have that press release for them, and then have a different press release for the for other stations that might be that might be interested in playing the whole record, or they might actually prefer the vocal tunes. So I think it's the, the more you can kind of drill down a little bit and see who you're dealing with, as Marilyn has spoken with, spoken about, see who you're dealing with and how you can without compromising your vision, tailor what you have to what they are most comfortable working with, that's how you can get a bit more traction. That's what, that's what I found anyway. But any, anyone else can speak to that? I'll just say that, that, that when a, a Shuffle Demons record comes to our radio station, there's such a giant leg up that, that you have with name recognition. You know, I, I, I can already hear the mus some part of the music in my head when I see the record, because you know the Shuffle Demons. That is such a huge advantage to someone that is a first-time artist or someone without already a profile. So that's almost what you're working against when you're when you're new to this, sending out a record. The record that comes with you you you're making so many judgments or you're or you're you're completely in the dark. But with something that you know, you're already 90% of the way there before the CD actually goes in the player. So it's it's almost like a completely different act of getting a new Shuffle Demons recording and getting a new recording from someone that might not have a profile yet. And it just speaks to the advantage of the, of the work that's gone in and creating that already, that, that, that mental image of, of the art and, and the work that you'll probably experience. I just wanted to say that uh, one of the main uh, jobs of uh, a manager or an agent is to build name recognition. Absolutely. Uh, and that this is something that doesn't happen quickly, but it happens by persistent daily work. Um, if you want to go and buy a television, you're, uh, each you will have had to see an advertisement or the name of the brand a minimum of eight times. And it's the same thing with a musician or an artist uh, of any kind, that the more times 
in a proper way, that you see the name in different contexts Absolutely. and cross your desk, you will then, the, that begins the name recognition, which of course has to be followed up by really great music. But the job, my job is to build somebody's name recognition. That's what I do every day. And that's exactly what we have to try and do as well as PR. Um, we have to go to the people that we know are very, very responsive and ask for acclamations from them for each artist. Um, and uh, there's, there's one person who we can always rely on, and it's not Brad this time, but it's uh, Mark Rayom at CBC Virtual Music Library. I, I send him, and, and he doesn't even wait for me to ask him yet. He sends me a mini review of each artist. Um, th and that, is, that goes to build the artist's uh, profile, which is what Ma Marilyn is talking about. You've got to build it up. You've got to build a page of acclamations or at least have two or three on the next media release or on your website or wherever, everywhere. And, and keep that coming and change it up. Um, I want to say one thing about media releases. When we send out three media releases, we are very, very aware and conscious and careful to change the headline, the heading of the email. Um, it's not enough to say uh, the great Shuffle Demons are releasing a new album three times. That's not going to. After a while, people are going to tune out. So you go, did you know that? Or hey, whatever. Make it different on the email address um, subject and on the media release because you're trying to let them know you have something new to say. That's about what we try and do. It doesn't help. <laughs> I will say it's not a deal breaker, but it, it, it speaks to the sensibility of, of the artist in a broader way. So I, I have been, f I, there have been many occasions where terrible album cover, great album, but m more times than not, it is some amount of representation of the care that went into the, the project itself and the, and the sensibility of the person that made, made that. I think from an artist's perspective, sometimes you've spent a lot of money doing the music and then you don't have as much money left to do the cover. Yeah, and, uh, or else, uh, often because we're not necessarily visually inclined, you know, you have a friend who does it, and, and, and when, you're at a, when you're at a level where you haven't, you're not hiring professionals to do it, then the friend maybe isn't as great as you, you thought they were, or whatever. So it can be, it can be detrimental. I mean, it's, it's, it sort of reminds me sometimes of film music, where they spend all the money on the film, and then they want you to do the music for 10 bucks, you know? So that's the thing that sometimes can happen, I think, in, in, in defense of why those covers might be out there. I, I would say, it, 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 don't worry so much about, if, if you can't afford to make that record, make it super simple. Make it something that doesn't get in the way of the music right. then. Don't go for something that you're shooting for that you're missing by a lot. You know, simple graphic and, and, and a plain kind of thing that will not get in the way of, of anything. And that's probably more to your advantage than going for something that you miss on. I agree. And I think that's what Marilyn's and my hope is each time we're walking, going towards working with an artist, is that we have time for some input from us to them. Um, I, I don't always get that, I very rarely get that opportunity, so I either have to love the music or I hate the cover and I don't even want to do anything more. I'm sure Marilyn's go uh, goal would be to have an input in the whole, the whole process, but sometimes they come with a finished thing and you take it or leave it. We, we put something out for Linus uh, music. That's the, the, the latest Shuffle Demons album. And we definitely, uh, we, Jeff Kulowick is the, the manager of the label. We, you know, we sent him some proofs. He said, what do you think of this back cover with us all in Mexican wrestling masks? <laughs> <laughs> he was like, yeah, I don't think so. I was like, okay, good. <laughs> we didn't think so either. I, uh, as, a, as an Asian manager, make sure <clears throat> that my graphics uh, speak to my aesthetic. And communicate what I believe in and what's important. And I, I use it across the board in my business card. When I go to a trade show, it, I'm noticeable because I have this, uh, echoes of the same kind of graphics everywhere I go. It's called branding, mm -hmm. uh, which is very important uh, in not only our industry, but every industry. I think we have run out of time, and I would like to say this has been a pleasure. Brad Barker, Richard Underhill, Marilyn Gilbert, Jane Harvey.